Welcome everyone to Home Education Council of America. We are um, in the middle of our special needs series, which is something that we're really excited to present with the homeschool community because it is a very big topic in the homeschool community. It is a reason why many parents decide to take on the responsibility of educating their children themselves. Yeah. It's because their child is dealing with some kind of a of a special need, whether it be ADD, ADHD, all the way through the autism spectrum, and many, many, many more um, challenges that make it difficult for them to uh, function in a institutionalized school setting. So with that, our guest today is Brian R. King, and uh, he has three boys with autism and ADHD and a great deal of experience in coaching parents uh, on how to um, create that win-win partnership so that they can have academic success at home. So uh, homeschooling the restless mind is our topic for today. Welcome, Brian. It's a pleasure to be here, Diane. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. We're excited to have you. And uh, you are also the author and publisher of a website, BrianRaymondKing.com, where you help a lot of people um, on this topic. Of, uh, we're, we're basically going to talk today about executive functions to Asperger's and ADHD. So tell us a little bit about um, uh, what we're going to what we're going to talk about today. What are we going to cover today? The main topics we're going to cover are the needs that really seem to elude most educators and often some parents. Because when they try to meet the needs of our kiddos in the classroom, it tends to be in service of the needs of the school and the teacher, not the child. I mean, they say time and time again that we care about the child, we want to meet their needs, they want them to succeed. But when you peel back the layers of the onion, you know darn well that the child is the last one being considered because they believe they need to prepare our children for what they've defined as the real world. And in schools, which are, I don't know, what, 40, 50 years behind the curve now, the real world that they're preparing our kids for no longer exists. We're well beyond the industrial age, and we're into the computer age and the information age. So all of these different things that our kids are using nowadays, texting, email, social media, that they're using to connect more effectively than the artificial environment of the school, that stuff's not even on the curriculum. So they're way behind as far as that goes. So we're going to talk about the needs that really matter in helping our kids be successful. And after that, we're going to discuss these little quirks called executive functions. And I'll define that better when we get into that category. But think of it as the skills that allow us to be effective in the world and what can stand in the way of those and how to correct it. Does that sound like a good place? That's awesome. I'm excited about this topic. Okay, um, so uh, doing the right things at the right time, that's what's critical, right, in educating a child. So let's talk about those um, essential human needs. How, how do they apply? There are six of them, and keep in mind, this is not just for kids with challenges. This is every human being. And sometimes people forget that just because you've labeled a child doesn't make them any less human than you are. A lot of the same rules still apply. And when it comes to meeting our needs, if you don't know what they are, then you spend a lot of time guessing and doing some hit or miss parenting. And what you end up doing is frustrating you and the child because what it reinforces for the child is you don't get it and you can't be trusted to meet their needs. Follow me? Mm-hmm, yeah. So when you know these six and you can then observe your child engaging the world through that lens, you have a better sense of what the child is going after. So you can then partner with your child to help them meet their needs more successfully so you can connect, earn that credibility that you so desperately need to have and become a trusted partner as your child navigates the world. So let's discuss what the needs are. The first one is certainty. Certainty means we need an element of predictability, things that we can count on. Now, one thing that can be common with these kiddos is wanting too much certainty. They want everything to be predictable. 
everything to be orderly, no surprises. Well, we know that we can't accomplish that. But what we can do is create as much certainty as possible. So just to put you on the spot here a little bit, Diane. Okay. Where do you like to have certainty in your life? What things do you want to count on? <laughs> I need to know what I'm having for dinner every day. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, that takes some planning, doesn't it? It does take some planning. It does. And, and and sometimes if I get real super busy or really stressed out with a lot on my plate, then then I go beyond fixing what's for dinner and I start to think about, oh my gosh, the mess this is going to create in my kitchen and I have to clean that up. So then I start to come up with an alternate plan. <laughs> so, um, but one yeah. thing that's really fortunate for you is you have the flexibility to create the alternate plan. Mm -hmm. And we'll get into that in one of the executive functions later on because the kiddos that want the most certainty have the biggest challenge with flexibility. Because one thing we'll say to our kids is, you know, you need to learn to go with the flow. You need to loosen up. You can't take things so seriously. You know, the world doesn't work like that. Well, that's true, but the ability to be flexible is actually a hardwired skill. Mm -hmm. It's not a character issue, which it most typically is attributed to. You know, you'll say, oh, you're just being stubborn. So you make it about who they are, when mm -hmm. the reality is, no. It's a neurological issue that when you can identify it, you can learn to work with it. So please remind me to come back to that, okay? It's very critical. Okay, I will. So the, the things our kiddos need to be able to count on for the purposes of homeschooling is they need an itinerary. They need to know what they're going to need to give their energy to throughout the day because some subjects require more concentration than others, more ability to hang in there longer versus giving short bouts of concentration. And having that predictability is really in service of helping your child also learn to self-advocate because he or she can tell you when they need a break, when they maybe need to get up, walk around, get a drink of water, and let their brain reboot a little bit before getting into the next subject. These are some really good ideas. It also gives them an opportunity to see, hey, when you say something, do you mean it? You know, you've laid out the plan. You followed the plan. You kept an agreement with them. Mm -hmm. That enhances trust. It also gives them some security in the world knowing that, guess what? There are certain problems I'm not going to have to solve today because some of our kids have very slower processing, and it's very difficult for them to deal with fast changes. So the more they know they can count on, it's one less thing to worry about, and it can bring their anxiety level down. Nice. Schedule the classes, schedule lunch break. If they need scheduled breaks to run an errand with you or walk around the block or take the dog out for a walk or whatever it is, something to just stretch their legs, get some nice, fresh, clean air in their lungs, and just decompress for a little bit. Because these marathon sessions that the schools require – really exhausts our kids and becomes education, makes education something that's painful, something that they have to do, that's drudgery, because it's too much. I've talked to many uh, educators in the school system who say, well, you know, he's got to learn to sit for long hours on that. He's got to learn to sit there and pay attention for long periods of time. If we give him too many breaks, he'll miss instruction time. And I tell them, he's missing it anyway. Mm -hmm. He's completely tuned out because his mind is exhausted. Mm -hmm. or she's sitting here watching the clock until the class ends so she can get up and stretch. Just because she's in the room doesn't mean she's paying attention to you. That's true. So they, they really need to wake up and see the reality of it and realize that instruction time is best for the child when their needs are met, not just when they're present. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, they really don't listen that well because they've – they're so entrenched in the paradigm that is the public school system that it's really difficult for them to conceive of it working otherwise. And the parents who do have the ability to homeschool their kids, it's amazing how much different their child becomes in an environment where their needs are met and they're able to learn according to the way their brain operates as opposed to the way the cookie-cutter public school system insists that they work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so you true. Have a lot more, you have a lot more quality control, and you can make the certainty and the other needs 
a real important part of their day, and they just blossom. It's amazing. And so certainty was the first need. The second one is variety. Variety, of course, is the opposite of certainty. Yeah. Because if you have too much certainty, too much you can count on, you get bored. So variety is those those changes, those aspects of your day that are new, different, pleasant. The, the simple thing of getting up from wherever you're working and going outside for a walk. That's variety. You've changed your context. You've gone from the inside to the outside. If you want to have something new for lunch today, if you are tired of the quiet and want to turn on a little music or watch a half an hour of TV, that's variety. Something to mix it up a little bit so that things don't become so boring. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. The, the third need is significance. And this is one thing I've taught in the school system consistently, repeatedly, over and over when they say, this is just attention-getting behavior. That's why he's acting like that. And attention, the way they see it is, this is a child being selfish. Yeah. Because the attention is supposed to be on the teacher, who is the most important person in the classroom. And anybody who tries to take attention away from the teacher is being selfish. And that's how they tend to see it. But what I point out to them is, no, this is a child that feels invisible and wants an opportunity to feel like he or she matters. That's what significance is about. It's not about self-importance. It's filling a very valid need. The way you can really meet the need of significance is genuine praise. You know, not blowing smoke up a child about, oh, you can be anything you want to be. If you just work hard enough, it's more in the moment. It's a thank you for your enthusiasm. Thank you for sticking with it. I'm so proud of you that you didn't give up, that you believed in yourself and you kept going. Mm -hmm. The best way to build a child's significance, let them help you. Show them they have strengths. When my children tell me about something they've learned that day, yeah, I learned it too. And I could say, yeah, I know that. Or I could say, that's pretty cool. I'm so glad you shared that with me. Where'd you learn that? Oh, I learned it in this class. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate that you thought enough to share that with me. I really appreciate that. Where you really demonstrate that in a moment they added value to your life and you appreciate them for that. And it's those little simple gestures. It doesn't have to be some grand overture where you throw a party for them because they passed a milestone. Those are nice too. But those big celebrations with six months of nothing doesn't build significance. Right. It's built in those everyday moments that you interact with your child. And if you make it a priority to honor the contribution they make to your life, you're going to have one confident child. Okay? Yeah, that's so the, true. The fourth need is love and connection. They, they kind of go together. And the easiest way to think of connection is when you have those moments where another person comes into your life and reminds you that you're not alone. They say something, they do something that you can relate to, and you say, ah, you think that way? Me too. You like that stuff? Me too. The me too moments are when somebody else just like you has stepped into your life and reminded you that there's someone that gets you. Mm. That's when you feel connected. Teachers, other mainstream classmates are really good at pointing out people's differences. You're weird. You're creepy. Mm -hmm. When they do stuff like that, they're saying, you're not like me. Mm -hmm. You're weird. You're different. That increases the feeling of disconnect. Mm -hmm. Or when the teacher says, you're being inappropriate, you're out of line, again, you're doing it wrong. You're not one of us. Right. As, as opposed to saying, well, you know, I can see why you'd want to do that right now. What do you think about doing what we're doing right now so that we can all work together to create this result, to be productive, whatever it is? Mm -hmm. So you're not scolding, you're redirecting. Because far too often parents, teachers alike, can focus so much on what they don't like that they can forget what they want instead. 
and they forget to tell the child that, so the child has an opportunity to solve correct. So I don't do a whole lot of scolding with my kids. I say, well, you know what? What you're doing right now doesn't really work. It makes it hard for me to hear what you want to say. It makes it hard for me to understand. Why don't you try it this way? So I remind them, I do want to connect with you. I do want to give you attention. But the way you're doing it doesn't make it easy for me to connect. Let's try something else that will work. So I acknowledge the need they're trying to meet. I let them know that what they're doing isn't working. And I give them the alternative. As opposed to just jumping on the behavior and saying, that's inappropriate. Go to the principal. You're in timeout. You had an opportunity there to connect. And you blew it. Well, and they're learning to communicate when you redirect. Also, they're learning how yeah, to com they're learning how to communicate their needs by you communicating your needs. I think that's absolutely. Yeah, it's modeling self advocacy too. You're absolutely right. And the love part of love and connection is when you are able to connect at the most vulnerable level. When you have a child that is able to discuss their fears their anxieties, when they're able to cry in your presence and you can hold them. And again, it's not about preventing them from crying because our kids are going to bump up against life like anyone else. Mm -hmm. They're going to have moments where they feel sad, depressed, where they're not going to like themselves very much. Your job as a parent is to make sure they know they're not alone while they're going through this. Mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of parents that think they need to rescue their kids so they never experience any pain. When you do that, you teach a child that they are not supposed to have any resistance in the world. They learn to be afraid of things not working. And you deny them the opportunity to build their resilience muscle. Their ability to withstand and work through those obstacles in life. So when you let life hit them and they fall down, and you're there and say, you can get back up, and I'm going to work with you. I'm going to be your partner so we can figure out how to do that together. Just make sure your child does not feel alone when going through those hardships. And that really builds a deep love between you and your child. Yeah, it does. And I think, I think you hit on something else there, too, about um, having them – being there for them and helping helping them to understand that they're not alone because as they do get older uh, parents get concerned about their kids channeling their um, that love and connection it's something that I just brought up a few days ago I was talking to someone I said one of the worst mistakes that we make as parents is as our children get older we think that they need more space and so we give them too much space and then they end up not feeling that love and connection at home and instead subconsciously they're out there looking for love and connection in the world and they end up getting it in the wrong places and in the wrong ways and so I think going back to that um, uh, what you had said about how they can, where they can go when they're feeling like they need to reconnect they need to know that they can do that at home um, so that they don't go out looking for it somewhere else and getting into trouble. Do you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. There are parents that would say, okay, you're an adult now. You need to figure this stuff out. You need to go and have those experiences. And what they, they think they're trying to foster independence in their kids, but what their kids many times are actually hearing is, dad doesn't care anymore. Mm -hmm. you know, I came to him wanting some reassurance. I came wanting to hear his opinion on things, and he totally blew me off. Mm -hmm. So you're having two different conversations there. One thing that's really, really neat is because my kids know that anything they bring to me is not going to be judged. It's going to be explored. Mm -hmm. So when they come to me and say, you know, I've been having these weird thoughts. I've been having these weird feelings. Oh, that's interesting. Tell me about that. As opposed to, oh, man, that's, that's what are you thinking that for, you know? Or that's, that's inappropriate. You shouldn't be thinking that stuff. The moment you jump on it, the more you shut the door. Mm -hmm. So I just approach it with some fascination, with some interest. Because I want them to understand that they need to be able to embrace whatever their mind does, whatever their body does. Because if they won't acknowledge it and be friends with it, how can they change it? 
So they have to be okay with not being afraid of whatever comes up. So my kids are able to come to me with anything, with nightmares they've had, with, you know, because they're all boys, the older two are in puberty, so they have certain thoughts about the female of the species, and they've got to be able to process that stuff. Mm -hmm. So they come to me and say, I'm thinking about this, about this girl, I'm thinking about saying this or doing that, and we could say, then I'll just say, well, hmm, that's interesting. Tell me if how far ahead you thought of that. If you were to say that, do you have any guess about what you would like to happen or what you think might happen? So they can be a little, have a little bit more foresight and problem solve, would this get the results they're looking for? If not, what else can we do? They very well could have gone off and done something that blew up in their face. Mm -hmm. But because they know they can come to me and it won't be judged, it'll be explored, they know they can be vulnerable with me but also be safe. Right. That's where the love and connection comes from, that I get that they want to have these vulnerable things respected. And I do that for all my clients too. I say, anything you bring to me, I'm going to respect it because I know how much courage it took you to, to share it with me. So I'm not going to stomp on it, judge it, dis discourage it or anything. Let's just explore it. Absolutely. Okay. Now, the fourth need is growth. And that basically means our kids need to feel like they're getting somewhere. They need to feel like they're making progress. Because one of the greatest difficulties with classic academia is it's a lot of memorization a lot of read, remember, and regurgitate. Mm -hmm. There's not a whole lot there that our kids can immediately take it and say, oh, I know exactly where I'm going to use this. Oh, memorizing dates of things that happened 200 years ago? Yeah, I can bring that up with my buddies next time we get together to play video games. You know, these kids don't understand where a lot of this is getting them. They don't feel like it's encouraging them to grow. But if they can go to their video games and they can beat that thing faster, they can get through a level in a faster time, that's measurable. And it's also something many of their friends are doing. So it's a means of connection. But the stuff that's coming up in schools, where on earth are they going to use that? You know, one of the great flexibilities you have in homeschooling is you can bring everyday life learning. One little joke I have with my kids is when I ask them to, to do a chore and they give me a little grief about it, I say, hey, this is life school. This is something you're going to be able to do later on when you're an adult. And aren't you glad I'm giving you this opportunity? I'm trying to prepare you for the world. I believe so much in your success. I want you to get a head start. I'm letting you vacuum the carpet today. You know, so it's a little bit joking, but they get the overall point that this is not wasted time for them. Right. It's actually a skill that's going to translate. That's awesome. <laughs> And that's what we do too, life school. Yeah, just help them feel, help them create experiences that are measurable, where they knew where they started, they knew where they ended up, and they know how they got there. And the more those experiences are meaningful for them, the more excited they're going to be about getting educated, as opposed to just getting schooling. Mm -hmm. Big difference. Now, the final need is contribution. They need to feel like that they can give something to the world that matters, that they have a gift that the world values. You build that sense of contribution by letting them do for you. Uh, I have, on top of, I have ADHD and dyslexia and a, a dash of Asperger's, I also have a physical disability. It's called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it makes the connective tissue in my body weak. So connective tissue meaning joints, ligaments, and so on. So my joints are very unstable. It's very hard for me to walk. I use a cane a lot. It's hard for me to sit up straight for long periods of time before I get tired because the connective tissue in my muscles makes it very hard for them to contract strong enough to hold me up. So that's why I'm in my recliner with my legs elevated because I need it to hold me up so we could have this conversation. And my boys are very good about contributing to me. 
when I need them to get me something, when I need them to open a door for me when we go out. They're wonderful about it, and I praise them for it. I let them know how grateful I am. So they're learning to look out for other people by virtue of their relationship with me, needing to support me. If there are volunteer opportunities that I, I think are good for them, I'll also encourage them to participate in that because I also want them to feel like they're part of a larger community, not just the one-on-one -on -one relationship. Because contribution exists on many levels. Mm -hmm. you, know, you contribute to the person. You contribute to the neighborhood, to the larger community. And tomorrow is voting day. Yeah. So if you go out there and vote, you are contributing, hopefully, meaningfully, to the, the national vibe, mindset, direction, whatever you want to call it. There are so many different ways our kids can impact the world and make a difference. And I make sure as much as possible that I give them those opportunities. That's awesome. I always say that community service is one of the best things you can do with kids who have any kind of um, special needs in the way of, of uh, Asperger's or ADHD because it does help them to, um, it, it helps to build their self-esteem and it helps them to, to give to the world in a way that uh, that's not really always accepted in, in other things that they do and other things that they interact outside of the home. It's not always, um, they're not always looked to for people, um, well how can I say this? Sometimes, like in an institutionalized setting, whether it be in a church group or a, or a school group or, or co-ops or anything, um, the leaders will tend to look to kids who don't have uh, some kind of a learning disabilities like Asperger's or ADHD because they don't think that those kids are capable of stepping up and being leaders when in reality they're actually excellent leaders <laughs> because they they want to serve more than than most other people they want really want to give and so I always tell parents get your kids involved uh, w parents who come to me and ask me what can I do with my child who's on the Asperger's uh, or on the autism uh, autism spectrum I always say get them involved in some kind of community service because it really will help them. So I appreciate you sharing that with us. You're talking about the picked last phenomenon. Yes. You know, I don't think you can do it. I don't think that you've got the ability. So I'll just, you know, they right. think I'll save you the embarrassment by leaving you out. Exactly. Nah, you humiliated me. And what you said about community service is spot on because this is an experience our kids need to have. The experience of being effective of taking action and creating a result. And when they're in the traditional school system, they're typically given attention for everything they're doing wrong. Mm -hmm. That's inappropriate. Don't shout out in class. Make sure you raise your hand. You interrupt it again. These are kids who are reminded every day that they are not good at making anything meaningful happen. So when you can take them out there, get their hands dirty, get them a, that's a figure of speech. Some kids with sensory issues don't want stuff on their hands. Mm -hmm. But I mean, kind of, kind of get in there and feel like, I did this, I created this result, and it helped somebody. Mm -hmm. Those yeah. are incredibly meaningful experiences. I got my oldest son, my 16-year-old, involved in some things, and he was beaming after he was part of that. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was transformational for him because he had a lot of bullying when he was younger. He feels pretty awkward at school. But when he is given those opportunities that feel bigger than him, suddenly his troubles at school feel a lot smaller. Yeah. So those are just wonderful ways to remind him that there's a bigger world out there, and that's the world that appreciates you. So don't worry about these jerks who take it upon themselves to try and belittle you. They don't matter. Their opinion doesn't have to influence how you feel about you. Let's worry about this larger world that we're contributing to. And it's just great. It's it's wonderful that you're passing out that advice as well. Yeah. Well it's amazing the it's amazing the uh, the effect of serving other people has on the self, no matter what you're going through. I mean, even people who have who suffer with depression or or uh, any kind of self esteem issues, when you take the focus off yourself and you put it on other people, it does amazing things for you. And so, yes, it does. Yeah, it does. Okay, so let's talk about executive functioning. Tell us again what executive functioning is 
and how do we accommodate the challenges that come with that? The best way to think about executive functions is they are the abilities that our brain has to take everything that we know and create a structured, organized plan with it so that we can use that information. One of the things that you'll see with our kids a lot is they'll know a lot, but they can't do anything. So you'll give them directions, and you'll say, do you understand? They'll say, yeah, because they do understand. They just can't apply it. So what you'll see in school is, okay, do you understand what you're supposed to do? Yeah, I understand. And they just sit there. Mm -hmm. They say, why are you sitting there? I thought you understood. Oh, I do. And maybe they'll say, I'm just not sure how to get started. Oh, it's real simple. Just follow the directions. And they still sit there. Yeah. Nothing is changing. Or you have a child that spaces out a lot, and they're being told that they're being rude, they're not paying attention, they must not really care, they're not motivated enough. No, the spacey kids have an issue with the executive function called sustained attention, which means it's very difficult to maintain their focus on you for a long period of time. And sustained attention deficiency is one of the hallmarks of ADHD. Attention. Attention deficit disorder. Mm -hmm. They have a hard time staying locked in. These are kids that are going to space a lot. And I need medication and coffee just to get my brain engaged long enough to start getting some things done every morning. Each of my boys is on a stimulant medication. I know people have different feelings about that. But in my thinking, it's one more tool in the toolbox. It's what allows them to be effective. There are some people that say, well, I need to do it by myself. I need to do it through you know, my, my own efforts. Well, people that do that are buying into the myth that the issue lies in your motivation that if you just tried harder, you could get past it. If that were correct, there wouldn't be people in wheelchairs. They could just wheel themselves to walk. Mm -hmm. Or I wouldn't, I wouldn't need these glasses anymore. I could just say, darn it, if I squinted harder, I know I could see 2020. You know, off with these glasses. But the reality is our brain is wired differently, and it doesn't reach the same results in the same way as everybody else that doesn't have that little glitch. So we find the tools that's going to help us be more effective. It can be medication. It can be coffee. It can be exercise. There are certain exercises that can really wake your nervous system up. Bilateral exercises where you use both sides of your body. Mm -hmm. People are fond of YouTube. There's a series of videos called Brain Gym that yeah. shows you how to do some of those bilateral exercises. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, I have. I've seen those, and I've actually used some of that with my own kids. What they do is they help both hemispheres of the brain talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Because one thing you find with kids with, with autism spectrum issues or ADHD is the hemispheres are not working together. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe have one that's working faster, one that's working slower. Sometimes the senses are out of sync. You see more quickly than you hear. So if you're looking at someone talk and you're also listening to them, it'll be confusing because the information isn't coming in at the same rate. Mm -hmm. You see their lips moving, but you hear it differently, and you're like, what is this person talking about? Yeah, it's like a foreign but, language. Yeah, because you're not seeing things in real time. Mm -hmm. In my case, I need to look away from a person to hear them because if I'm watching their facial expressions – and their mouth move, it's so distracting I stop hearing them. So that's how I need to do it. My older son needs to watch a movie but also read the captions underneath. Otherwise, he has no idea what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I suspect he has the same issue I do. Yeah. So we got all thinking about sustained attention. A little tangent there, which my ADHD tends to do. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. One of the the more common, did you have a question? No. Okay. no. One of the most common executive function issues is called working memory. And working memory is that part of your memory. It's also sometimes called short-term memory. But what it refers to more specifically is your ability to hold the information in your awareness that you're currently using. 
So let's say that you give somebody a three-step process. You say, do step one, step two, step three, let me know when you're done. Working memory is responsible for holding those steps in your awareness as you apply them. My working memory is in the third percentile, which means it absolutely stinks. Mm. I don't remember things. My working memory is like Teflon. You tell me something, it slides right off. So I need to be given to it in writing or I need to be allowed to write it. Then I can look at it, try and apply it a little bit. Oh, darn, I forgot again. Look at it again. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I need to look at step one five to ten times before I actually get it done. And in school, that's intolerable. Right. They'll tell you, oh, you're, you're falling behind. Come on, you need to concentrate harder. You need to try harder. You, you need to keep up. We can't wait for you. Well, then maybe I'm in the wrong room. Mm -hmm. now, that's what it essentially comes down to. I've had parents tell me, you know, what, what do we need to do? What, what can we do from to help them catch up? You're missing the point. The problem is likely a fit between your child and that context. If you give the child the space, if you give them the opportunity, you let them move at their own pace, they can produce. Some of our kids are meant to be snails, not rabbits. Some of them need to be given time to just progress at their own rate. They're not failures because they're not out there on the racetrack like the other kids. Maybe they just need to walk. And in my case, I found about my working memory, if I'm given time, I can kind of build up some momentum and be productive. But I'm not going to come out of the gate strong. That's just not how my brain works. And because I'm so forgetful, and again, remember, the public school system is all about memorization. Right. We are in the Google area. You don't need to remember anything. Well, who was the fifth president? Give me five seconds. Google it. Oh, here he is. What's the point? of memorizing that. You don't need to. The memorization is pointless. What you do need to be able to do is create and follow a plan. Those are life skills that matter. And because I have such a hard time remembering things, and man do I love technology. Apple is my best friend. I just got one of the new iPhones, and I'm that much more productive because of the bigger screen. I can now look at much more information. I can manipulate it better. All of my lists, all of my reminders, all of my tools that make the fact that my memory stinks not mm -hmm. a big deal. If I had to rely on my brain so much, I'd forget to do everything. I'd be late for every appointment. I forget to make phone calls. But because of this device and apps, I can be so much more productive because I've been able to compensate for the fact that I have poor working memory. And in a lot of schools today, you have to fight uphill to get your child the opportunity to use these tools that, guess what, are going to be accessible to them when they're adults. Mm -hmm. They'll get to use their smartphones. They'll get to use their apps. But in school, they're encouraged to believe that they're failures if they have to use these tools because they're accommodations. Big change that needs to happen there. Mm -hmm. Another executive function is task initiation which means getting started. I alluded to this earlier with the child you can give instructions to. They say they understand, but they sit there. Mm -hmm. Task initiation means it's hard to take the first step. So one way you can prompt them is to just say, okay, you understand? What are you going to do first? Because if you have a child that's scattered, you've given them the three steps. But oftentimes, those st three steps are in their head with the 20,000 other thoughts they're having because it's like a snowstorm in there. It's scattered. So they're trying to quiet that noise while they're trying to think about how to implement. But the moment you ask, what are you going to do first? Now that question allows them to prioritize their thinking better. They grab the ones they need to begin, and they get started. So that's one way to really help them. Awesome. Two more I'll get into. One is planning, prioritizing, which means how do we take all the information in our head and put it in a logical sequence? That's very difficult for a lot of our kids to do because they see everything as having the same value. There is no one, one step and third step and fifth step. They're all alike. 
Mm-hmm. So one thing that I recommend, because a lot of our kids tend to organize better when they're moving, when they're kinesthetic. So you stand them up and you say, okay, take one step forward and tell me what's the first thing you're going to do. It may be they write it down or you write it down. Then you ask, okay, once you're done with that, what does it make sense to do next? Have them step forward again and give you step two. Mm-hmm. Now that may take a little while, but guess what? That's what their brain needs to do. And when you're taking a, uh, a step forward, aren't you moving both legs? Hmm, little bilateral activity to get the, the two halves of the brain talking to each other. Mm-hmm. That can be very effective, but here's the cool thing. Once you create this template or this outline of how to sequence things, maybe you can use it again. So this exercise is something you shouldn't have to do every time. I have a lot of outlines and templates that I can just cut and paste things into because the the sequence is already there. I just need to put the information. Mm -hmm. The hard thing for us to do is to create that structure. Because I'll go to my wife and I'll ask her, you know, I need some kind of a a flow chart for this information or I need some kind of a spreadsheet. And for the life of me, my brain just doesn't picture it. I don't know how to do it. But she can go and put it together and I'll say, that's exactly what I need. Thank you. And then I'll just put all the information in where it belongs. The last one, now keep in mind, there are about 12 executive functions. So we're just, I'm kind of zeroing in the ones that are most common. Okay. So the last one I want to talk about is time management. There are many of us, myself included, who cannot feel time pass. And if they say, well, how long did that take? Mm, About 15 minutes. I don't know how long it took. I was focused on what I was doing. In fact, I get a little panicky if I'm in a room that does not have some kind of a timepiece. Thank thank goodness my phone tells time. Because if there's no clock on the wall, if there's no watch on me, I get so restless because watching the second hand, watching the minute hand, you know, watching the, the digital numbers change, that's how I know time has passed. And when you can't feel time pass and you can't measure it, you feel very disoriented. You're going to be much more fidgety. It's going to be a lot harder for you to focus. So some classrooms have actually removed the clock mm-hmm. or they put it in the back of the room. You are not doing kids with time management any favors. There are some people that they take the clock out because they think it will be one less distraction. The kids will focus on the teacher instead of focusing on the clock. Mm-hmm. Well, for our kiddos, no, you're making it harder for them. They need to have some means of feeling time pass. And that's also the reason why having reminders around you is very important, whether it's a computer that's keeping track of things, whether it's an app on a phone that lets you know when the hour you've set aside to complete a task is almost up because we can really hyper-focus. Now, if there's nothing to interrupt us, we can just – totally zoom in for five hours straight without a bathroom break and we won't even know that time has passed. Mm -hmm. We need little things to interrupt us to help us be much more productive. So schedules, reminders, alarms, a to-do list with specific times, start and stop times next to it to keep us oriented to time because otherwise it can really elude us. Okay? Okay, awesome. Now, the final piece of our discussion today, unless you have some questions. Well, I just wanted to to, to comment that these, these four executive functions that you shared with us, working memory, task initiation, planning, prioritizing, and time management, are all things that they will need as adults. So I appreciate you zeroing in on those four. You know, if you're going to cover any of the 12, those four are really critical for these kids to learn as they, because we're not raising children, we're raising adults. But someday they're going to be adults. And so we are raising our children to become competent adults. We don't right. want to send them out there being helpless. Right, right. Which is overprotected kids are. They're used to being rescued and used to adults solving their problems for them. Mm-hmm. And they begin to question their own competence. Because every time you step in, and I hope everybody listens to this point, every time you swoop in to rescue, what you're teaching your child is, I don't believe in you. Yeah. I don't believe in your ability to handle this for yourself, so I'm going to do it. 
-hmm. And they think they're being helpful, but they're doing much more damage than they realized. And I just remembered that there was the one executive function I wanted to talk about that wasn't on my list, and that's flexibility. Okay. And flexibility is your ability to, when you encounter a situation that you said, this is how it's going to go, this is how I want it to turn out, and then it goes different. Flexibility is your ability to adapt to that change. Like when you were talking about dinner. Mm-hmm. You had one plan, but oh my goodness, it turns out you know the meat is older than you thought, or you don't have an ingredient from the store. Now you've got to do something else. Mm-hmm. People with flexibility issues will freeze in that moment. Some kids have meltdowns. They have panic attacks. They get anxious because now there's this vacuum. They had plan A, and that's it. Mm-hmm. They have no idea how to say, oh, well, this is interesting. I didn't uh, plan for this. What are my options? What can I do instead? So one of the, the most direct ways to help our kids build their flexibility is every plan you make with them must have a plan B. If plan A doesn't work out, what's our next step? So that when you do bump into those walls where, well, guess what? As it turns out, plan A is not going to work. Thank goodness we planned for this. Mm-hmm. So now they feel like they have certainty because there was a plan for what to do, a predictable alternative, as opposed to the surprise that things didn't work out exactly as they planned. And you teach them to get into the habit of coming up with the plan B. Mm -hmm. And that's the simplest way to begin creating flexibility. My two older boys used to fall apart when things would go differently. But Mm -hmm. since I've introduced the plan B, when we're talking about what we're going to do, we're going to go out and have an afternoon together, I hear them making suggestions right away. Well, we could go there, but what do you say we go there instead? And if it happens and be closed, well, maybe we can do this. They've gotten so good at it, they're way ahead of me on the planning. <laughs> good. It's wonderful when we can help our kids grow. So, now the grand finale. And you mentioned it when you introduced our conversation that it's – This larger talk here, the larger concept is creating win-win relationships with your child. Mm -hmm. One thing that's important to understand is that partnerships are held together through agreements. The rules that you have determined with your child are the rules for how you're going to work together. And there are four agreements that I found that are essential for creating that partnership with your kids. The first agreement is that you're actually in a partnership, which means you agree that you're in it together. It's not that the the big bad controlling adult is coming in and telling the child what to do. Because in a traditional school environment, the ch- kids aren't there because they want to be. I mean, there are some kids that really love school and they cry when the school year is over. They're very rare children. Yeah. But our kids are used to going through the door and having all their power taken away. It's someone else's agenda. If they don't become good little submissive followers, they're given detention or there's a call home or something like that. Mm-hmm. But the homeschooling situation, we have much more flexibility. They know that there needs to be a student and a teacher. There need to be two people there that are learning, two people that are committed to results, And as long as you're in that partnership together, you can be successful. The second agreement is agreeing to where the power lies. Is your partnership win-win, win-lose, or lose-lose? Win-lose is what I just described, where you give up your rights, the teacher's in charge, you have no say, and you are supposed to be submissive. Now, you wonder why kids act out in class when that's what they're being asked to agree to kids that smart off, kids that cause a little bit of trouble. These are kids that are basically saying, I have choices that I can make. I can be self-determined. I'm not going to be completely submissive to you. So in many cases, some of this acting out is very healthy. But because it disrupts the teacher, it's punished. You have to be a follower to be successful in that environment. And the worst case scenario is lose-lose. This is when a child is upset, feels powerless, feels angry, and wants to make sure you feel the same way. If you've ever seen any of these kids having a bad day, they'll try and, you know, knock something over that you care about. They'll Mm -hmm. take their homework and tear it up, and you'll say, why'd you do that? We spent so much time working on that. 
ah, now it's lose lose. Now we're equal. Yeah. Because now we feel bad. And we know it doesn't get us anywhere. But the win win arrangement is when you both feel successful. Both of your needs are getting met, like certainty, variety, significance, and so on. So you really have to be tuned into making sure it's as balanced as possible. Is the more you feel like you matter, the more a child feels like he or she matters, the more there is for you to be invested and excited about in terms of the educational process. The third agreement is, what's the outcome that we're working towards here? Because there's often a disconnect in the traditional classroom. The teacher needs to get through certain tasks in the lesson plan by the end of the period. Mm -hmm. But let's say one of the kids is just fretting about, man, there's this kid that always pushes me up against the lockers after this class, and i got to try and get out that door as soon as the bell rings so I can get away from it. I'd say we have competing outcomes. Mm -hmm. So this is a child that's distracting. You're saying, pay attention, pay attention, and this kid's more in survival mode. A lot of disconnect that way. But when it's one-on-one -on -one in the homeschool environment, or maybe one-on-five, depending if it's, if it's a co-op or just working at home, you can have a discussion about, so what do we want to have done here? How do we define success? What are you hoping to know more of or be better at by the time this is over? Mm -hmm. Verbalize it, agree to it, then you're going to have that partnership, that sense of purpose, same outcome, and you're going to be much more productive, a lot less resistance. The fourth agreement is, what's the process for achieving that outcome? How are we going to do it? Are we going to play a game where we quiz each other? Are we going to have to, am I going to have to help you get started? It might be as a task initiation issue. There are a variety of ways to do it because you know as, as well as anyone that our kids have different learning styles. Mm -hmm. And many teachers teach according to their own learning style. That's true. And they can often completely miss the child. Because my older boy tells me all the time how if there are a lot of PowerPoints, he totally tunes out. Mm -hmm. Because he needs to have it explained, demonstrated, then he can do it. But if it's just look at this picture, read these directions, goes right over his head. Mm -hmm. So those are the teachers he ends up having to spend extra time with either before or after school where he can get the one-on-one -on -one attention and get the instruction fashioned more so for his learning style. That's when everything clicks for him. Sometimes the, the classroom environment just doesn't work. So those are the four agreements for women partnership. And everything else that we've discussed, meeting the six essential needs through those agreements understanding what executive functions may be present and how to accommodate them. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. But if you get these things in place, you are creating a foundation for success that these kids are typically not given in a public school classroom. And there may be some exceptions. There always are. Because I've seen them where the staff is tremendously hands-on. They're very proactive, and they can really make it a good fit for the child. But unfortunately, it's rare. I wish it were more common. Mm -hmm. Well, I could. See, I really appreciate all the stuff that you've shared with us today. I took so many notes. That's why I was, I was pretty quiet, actually. I took a lot of notes here. Um, where can people go to get more information from you? Because I just think that they're going to want to hear from you again. Absolutely. There's two places they can go. My main website is my name, Brian Raymond King. Dot com No hyphens, no underscores, just all together. You'll see articles and a bunch of other things I've done. Then there is a podcast website. Okay. It's succeedwithadhdanyway.com. You'll see video and audio podcasts there where I give much more extensive explanations of lessons. And I'm pretty sure it's episode four where I spend an entire hour on all of the executive functions. And it's completely free to you. You just got to go there, find it, and listen. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, perfect. Okay, again, thank you so much for sharing. Now, um, we're going to do a Q&A. Um, we'll broadcast this, and then we'll do a Q&A sec section with you. So um, those of you who are listening to this recording, um, look 
below on the same page and there'll be the information there for when Brian is going to do the Q&A so you can ask him questions live. So we'll get that set up and we'll let everybody know when that's going to happen. Um, but I just think we have covered so many wonderful things today and, and these are things that actually not only will they help homeschooling parents, you're going to help a lot of people with the information that we got today, but I think that I can see you giving this discussion to school teachers because they need to have this information so they can be better and recognize where they're breaking down the communication with these kids. So oh, and um, I do, I do entire trainings for school populations. Yeah. Not as many as I would like to, but uh -huh. there are some school districts that utilize me and I can go all over the country. Mm -hmm. So if anybody listening is connected with a school district that things could benefit from this, send them to this video so they can watch it. Yeah, I, I'm going to be sending people because I'm connected with a lot of school districts that want to know what we're doing out here at Home Education Council of America. They constantly have their eye on what we're doing because we're giving people information that actually works and helps them. So again, I appreciate your time today, Brian. We will uh, catch you on the Q&A. Um, and uh, thank you for your time, and thank you for the wonderful information that you've shared with us today. It's been a pleasure.